But today's message is an interesting message in that uh, God is calling his followers, and Peter's uh, uh, instructing us, that we need to begin to follow in his steps. And in, in this passage in particular, uh, it's, he's challenging the Christian. Remember, just a little recap if you haven't been with us, is that he went from, um, from a theological positioning of who we are, what God has called us to be, and into more of an application. So last week we talked a lot about application in terms of how do we respond to our leaders over us in terms of our government. So this week is going to hit a little closer to home. And we're going to talk about things that can be a little bit challenging. But I'm going to assure that God is calling you to make sure we stand our ground in our faith. That your character really matters in the midst of persecution, in trial, in tribulation. He's, Peter's been calling us in all Christians since then to live a holy life separated from what our worldview is, what we, we live in daily. He's calling us to live differently, that we have been chosen by God for God. And so this week we hit, this week we hit this new idea that we're talking about slavery and servants. And there is language that some may pass over this because it addresses this idea but I'm going to encourage you to reorient your thoughts to be able to focus on the principle that Peter is getting to. Don't get so caught up in the word servant. Don't get so get caught up in the word slave. Because what you may think of slave in the Civil War era is not the same slave or servant that Peter is addressing. So we want to make sure we're reorienting our brain to that, even though it's very difficult because of what we have been taught and learned um, throughout history in American culture. Our surrender to any earthly authority is significant to our testimony of who Christ is. When we become selfish, disrespectful, or even egotistical, we diminish the name of the one who laid it down for all of us. And when I say egotistical, something, we all, do you know we all have ego? Right? William Machini once said that we all have one of two egos. We're either edging God out meaning our ego is so big we're edging God out and it's all about me, or we're exalting God only. So we all have an ego. And what we do with that matters to the people we encounter every single day of our lives. So are you going to be a person that's going to edge God out when you're upset and things are not going the right, right way? And are you, are you going to follow in his steps and exalt God only? For that really does matter. So we're going to delve into the passage in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. If you will, turn over in your Bibles or turn on your app, and we're going to read this together. And again, this is an interesting uh, conversation that, or letter that he's given to us this morning. But he says this, start off. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate. Remember, listen to the language being spoken here. Not just those who are good and considerate. It's easy to serve people well when things are going good. But also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it that you credit, credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Hence the title. Since you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the judge justly. He himself bore our sins in his body, our cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And if you're familiar with that passage, you can go all the way back in Isaiah. And that same statement is being made here. Isaiah 53. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. As mentioned, Peter addresses the servants to slave owners in his letter, but his message extends to all believers 
who find themselves in situations of suffering and mistreatment. In the Roman Empire of Peter's time, slavery was widespread, and many Christians were servants or slaves within households where they faced varying degrees of mistreatment for their faith. Again, when it came to slavery in, in those days and servants, it, it's not like it is today. So our first point today is the call to submission. That's a very, in, it, in modern day context, that word submission is a very dirty word, is it not? It's got a very negative attachment to it, a connotation to it. It's very demeaning. It seems uh, like it's my way. It's the way I should do it. I should never have to submit to anybody. I remember, it may be, how many of you have been in the military in here? So you know, when your drill sergeant would come to you, and when you first got off that, that, uh, uh, that bus, right, and you're walking in, and they're telling you and barking orders at you, how difficult was to submit to them? Or maybe, how many of you guys have ever played a sport? When that coach comes to you and says, you know what, you better pick up the slack or you're going to have the whole team punished. Or, how many of you ever had a mom and dad? I don't need to say anything else, do I? You see, regardless of where we're at, in life, there is unjust moments. There are good moments. But when we are mindful of God, when we think of God only in those times of injustice or unrighteous moments, it's easier to endure to get through the trial that we're facing. In just a second, I'm going to cue up a video. And in this video, I don't want to give it completely away, but there's, a, there's an unjust cause that took place recently. <coughs> And I think it's interesting to me uh, to listen to his voice. Yes, it's Hollywood. Yes, it's, it's manufactured to some degree. But the story is still the story. And this man was ridiculed and unjustly, basically, his life was taken away from him for an unjust cause. So go ahead and cue it up and be inspired. I'm a big fan of America's Got Talent. My wife and I, that's our date night because we can't get away. But we're thankful for these moments here. So I'm in the bed crying while she's in there. What are you crying for? These are moments why I cry. My name is Archie Williams. Right, let's get to know you first of all, Archie, a little bit. Okay. I, uh... I was just incarcerated for 37 years for somebody else's crime. Ooh. DNA freed me. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, my God. On the morning of December the 9th of 1982, a 30-year-old white woman was raped and stabbed in her home. I was arrested on January the 4th. I couldn't believe it was really happening. I knew I was innocent, I didn't commit a crime. But being a poor black kid, I didn't have the economic ability to fight the state of Louisiana. I was sentenced to life in 80 years without the possibility of parole or probation. When you know you're faced with dark times, what I would do is I would pray and sing. This is how I got peace. I can't lie. No more of your darkness. All my pictures seem to fade to black and white. And time stands still before me. Frozen here on the ladders of my It's always someone else I see. Mm. I 
just another fraction of your life to wander free. But losing everything is like the sun going down. Thankful many of us in this room have never had to go through that. But if you look at his response in the midst of wrong, what got him through it was his rejoicing to the Lord. His focus and attention was on God and God alone. Was it fair? No. And you can look back at 39 years of his life and say, you know what? And if he continues on to sing, and it's just a beautiful story what God did there. But I think there is a parallel here. If you look at the Apostle Paul, I think he was a man that was unjustly put in prison, was he not? And in that prison, I think him and another friend, if you recall, what did they do? They sang in praise. And God showed up in very powerful ways. Whether the, the ground shakes or the, the, the jailer and all that, set, everything becomes free or you are incarcerated for 38 years, it doesn't matter the outcome. What matters is what you're going through and who you're focused in on. The object of the praise. So whether you're suffering here today, regardless of your being treated unjustly, or you're continuing to represent Jesus no matter the circumstances, you are to represent Jesus no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, when it gets difficult. And listen, I'm telling you, I had a conversation for about an hour last night with a friend of mine. This wrecked me. Because you want to talk about sometimes having a hothead, Sometimes when I don't like the things the way they're, they're going in my home, or I don't like the way things are going at work, or I don't like the way the world is going, I don't like the way the government's run, I don't like the way uh, bosses are and how people are mistreated, I, sometimes I can react in an ungodly way. And God is wrecking me in this idea of, I'm in control. Live a holy life. Live justly amongst the pagans, so to speak, the non-believer. Live righteous among your leaders. Live righteous among the people that oversee your bosses, no matter the circumstance. So Peter is addressing that this morning. No matter whether it's 38 years or three months, God is in control, and he will always be in control. <coughs> you see, this command of surrender or submission is challenging to our modern sensibilities. But Peter focuses on enduring suffering for the what? The sake of righteousness. Listen, our citizenship is not here, as we're reminded throughout this book. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our, our focus should not be on the things of the temporal, but the things of what God is going to do and what he is doing in the now. God is so good. He emphasizes, Peter is emphasizing that enduring mistreatment with a mindset of focus on God's approval rather than the human recognition is commendable in God's sight. Their, the Christian duty was to yield to their masters. What does that mean for us today? I think it's fair parallel for us to apply Peter's word of employment. I, I don't know if you've ever had a bad boss. Anybody have ever had a bad boss before? I would say that's similar to what he's talking about today. Now, obviously, there are things that we do in American culture that it did not take place in those days uh, where Peter walked. Uh, we can qu quit if we don't like our employment, can we not? 
But in a household, servant could not just do that. We have rights that protect us from many kinds of mistreatment, but they did not. I think this is only amplifies the parallel because their situation was worse than ours. And yet, Peter is still reminding us, submit yourselves regardless to what God has for you and focus on him and not the circumstance. Focus on him, not the circumstance. Submit to God, not the circumstance. We need to follow in the Lord's steps. The Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6 says what? Not my will be done, but yours. It's a posture of submission. Lord, I, and, and I, I can't think, but, uh, and we're going to go in here in a little bit, but I, I, I can't just get the image out of my mind. And if you've watched The Passion of the Christ, and I'm sure you guys watched that uh, TV series. Um, anyway, uh, Chosen. The Chosen. And you, you, you know when Jesus was walking in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's with his friends and everything's going on. And I, I think the calmness that he was portraying in the midst of the greatest storm of his life's going to be. And he knew it was coming. In fact, obviously, the, uh, the record tells us he was sweating blood. He was going through some tur- inner turmoil. He was battling. And yet, God said, not my will, but yours. Jesus knows a little bit about something about being unjustly taken advantage of. And remember, Jesus was not just fully God, but he was also fully man. He felt just like we did. The betrayal was still there because he even announced it about his father. Talked about his father betraying him. Point number two. How do you suffer well? You ever contemplate that in your own life? How do you suffer well? We all go through it. And it, 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 it is a spectrum of suffering. What suffering may be for me is not going to be the same thing as you, and that's okay. Suffering is individual in a lot of ways. And sometimes you're going to grow through that suffering. In fact, Peter is going to talk about later in the letter that how you go, grow through suffering. Is actually, and if you look at James, the half brother of Jesus, he talks about suffering in the, his book. How do you grow through suffering? How do you overcome the suffering that you're going through? How are you fighting the temptation of reacting in the flesh and surrendering to the Spirit? How do you do that regularly in your day to day walk? Because for this you have been called, the scripture says, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was he deceit found in his mouth. When he was hateful, he did not insult in return. When he was suffered, he did not threaten. But when he continued in trusting in himself to him who judged justly, meaning that he focused on God the Father in his unjust moments. What a powerful display of control and character and integrity that Jesus had in those moments. What a powerful moment that Paul did in the moment when he was jailed. What a powerful moment that you see in this man that was unjustly persecuted for something he did not do. We may suffer for many reasons, friends. For many. Some suffering comes from as a direct result of our own sin, the things we cause ourselves. And some happens because of our foolishness. And some in the result of living in a fallen there are things that are out of our control. We live in a world that's imperfect, and we deal with people that are imperfect and systems that are imperfect regularly. So what should we expect out of that is imperfection. But yet, so often, we expect people to be perfect. We expect systems to be perfect. And when they aren't, we react in foolish ways. God is calling us to a place of surrender and submission to him. He wants you to surrender to him and him alone. Our goal should be to face suffering as he did. Our goal, our goal, let me repeat that again, as hard as that sounds, our goal should be that we should endure suffering. That way when it arrives, we know how to Act and respond righteously in the midst of 
the circumstance. We should respond with patience and calmness and confidence, knowing that God controls our future. Amen? I mean, you think about that. That gives a sense of assurance of, I think about just a little story. I was at the Luray Caverns this week, and we were up on the side of a mountain. You ever had that breathtaking moment? You're like, and just things just calmed. You just saw God's creation in mind, and it's like, man, God is in control. You ever get that overwhelming feeling? I think that's what he's saying in the midst of the storms of life, in the midst of injustice, or injustice, in, uh, in, in trouble. My future is in his hands. And the people that you work with, the future is still in his hands. Whether you know Jesus or you don't, he is still the author and the perfecter of life. He's the one that's still given breath in the people's lungs, regardless if they follow him or not. He is the one that gives life and he ones that takes life. He is worthy to surrender to. Third and final point. Redemption is going to come. Redemption will come. In your unjust circumstance, in the trials of life, and whether it's your boss unjustly accusing you, or your circumstances at home are difficult, or the challenges around you, and in close-knit family relationships, if you don't like the things that are going, listen, redemption's on its way. Jesus is going to come back again. That should give us a sense of hope and assurance that, listen, I don't have to respond in a retaliatory way. I don't have to negate and be disrespectful and angry and bitter towards the circumstance that happened to me. I don't have to go through that because Jesus is on his way. His redemption is going to be near. And when we respond with an appropriate holiness to people, Paul reminds us that you keep what burning coals of love on their head. By why? Why do we do that? Because God is worthy to surrender to, friends. He is worthy to surrender to. And we only do it because he did that. And he demonstrated that. He lived it. He showed it. And he poured it out all for us. That's our reason to do what we do. But yet, when we don't get our way, we become reactionary. Or we don't like the way something's done. We take things in our own control without ever going to the Father first. And if anything that Jesus taught us in the moments of injustice, injustice, or of not being treated fairly, is to go to him first. Cry out to him, he says. Cry out to him. He himself, what? Bore our sins. Close your eyes for a minute. I don't like bringing up negative thoughts. I think it's interesting when he says, bore our sin. Think of all the wrong things you have done in your life. Not to bring condemnation, not to bring any type of judgment, but it's understanding and perspective that everything you have done has been wiped away because of the work on the cross. That's why we come and celebrate, friends. That's why we surrender our lives. You can open your eyes. I don't want you to fall asleep on me now. <laughs> I know it was a little bit, you guys are comfortable there. That's good. By his wounds, you have been healed. Sometimes that's a physical healing. But more often than not, with 100% certainty, 100% certainty, you are healed spiritually. Because of what he did on the cross. He's reminding you, friends, whether it's Nero in control in this particular passage, 
whether it's our own bosses, the, uh, the circumstances we fight ourselves, find ourselves in regularly, that he bore our sins and he laid them on the cross and he says, by his wounds you are healed. You have sure confidence in that. You have the opportunity to say, you know what, I can lay these burdens down and leave them there because God died for them. And that he will heal your spirit. And at times, yes, he will even heal your body through that. Because some things were unjustly done to some of you in this room, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, that God is saying, I want to heal you. I believe that. I believe that with everything in me. The Christian mission I believes that in its totality. That's why he went to the cross. He brings healing to our brokenness and restoration to our right relationships with God. As believers, we are no longer lost and wandering, but we have returned to Christ, our shepherd, and the one who cares for our souls. Jesus suffered patiently. Think about that. Jesus suffered patiently. It wasn't just, I'm killing Jesus, folks. It's not just, I took his life right away. He suffered well. And it was a long time he suffered and he had you and I in his mind. I believe that with everything in me. Jesus regarded God as the sovereign one, so he put the outcome of his life in God's hand. So as we close, friends, worship team, you can come forward. This message today speaks directly to us in our own journeys of faith. Whether we face mistreatment at work or in our communities or in our families, Peter's words challenge us to respond with grace and humility and trust in God's justice. Let us remember that Christ has shown us the way. Christ has shown us the way. He has created this canvas, this beautiful canvas of what surrendered life looks like till birth, till death. To a birth of being born in the major and growing up in the church and, and, and preaching and teaching a unique calling to death when he was betrayed by the people that so loved him. And he did it with grace and humility. He showed us to the end what it means to continue to do the right thing. When everybody else would turn, he surrendered to his father. May we as followers of Christ reflect this love. Reflect it. So much so as you think about looking in the mirror this morning to get makeup on and to do your hair and to do the things that you need to do to reflect and make sure you are beautified. That when we are looking in the mirror, we are reflecting the image of Jesus to our world. And not only to our world, but the people that have hurt us. I don't say that lightly, friends. There are many people on my journey that have hurt me, and I had to stare them in the eye and still hug them and say, I love you. And the ones that most hurt you often is your family, at least in my circumstances. They don't have the same worldview as I do. I have a Christian worldview. It's all about Jesus, friends. I expect the world to do worldly things. I expect the world to do hurtful things. I expect the world to do those things. In fact, I anticipate it. So when hurt is lavished on you by your bosses, when hurt is lavished on you by friends and families that don't know Jesus, it is becoming, it's like, okay, whatever. still to forgive, walk humbly, love well. The circumstance doesn't change because the attention is still Jesus and Jesus alone. Because we're dealing with imperfect people serving an amazing and perfect God. That's the beautiful thing that we get. We don't hold on to grudges because God died for them. We, lavish, we surrender our life to Jesus and Jesus alone. And we, when we do that, we will follow in his steps just like that coach, just like that mom or dad, just like that boss, you take them along the road with you with my hand and they walk in your steps with you. Although they're not going to be the same steps, 
They're walking in step. Meaning I'm not going to walk the same life Jesus walked. I'm not going to walk the same life Peter walked. I am not going to walk the same walk that man walked in, in 38 years in prison. I am not walking the same walk my brother did. I'm not walking the same walk that Jody did. I'm not going to walk the same way that Jesus did. I'm not going to walk. But we're walking in step knowing that the Savior's got us by the hand and we're looking towards him because we have a hope and a future coming. And not only do we have a future and hope coming, but he is leading us through the now. He's leading us in the now. We don't have to anticipate always what's coming, but we know what in the moment, right? Today is the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Meaning our attention is focused on him and him alone. When we take our attention off the things that really matter, which is God, we become depressed, anxiety, driven, angry, bitter, frustrated. We focus our circumstances on the circumstance rather than one that says, I want to release you from this. Peter's saying, listen, if all God, when I first started this series, I opened this series up. Peter knew something about not doing the right things all the time. And yet, he wanted to walk in the steps of the Savior. He surrendered his life. He gave it all for him. When Jesus says, come and follow me, he said, yes, I'm going to lay down everything to follow him. This life that he's talking about is a life of surrender. It doesn't matter your job or your occupation. It doesn't matter your circumstance. It doesn't matter your boss. It doesn't matter the rulers of the government. It does not matter. Our boss is King Jesus. And when we follow him and surrender to him, nothing else matters. I just think of walking, just things are just falling off. Things are just falling. The things of this world are falling off me. And as I walk closer to him, I look more and more holy like Jesus. That's incredible. That's incredible. And we should rejoice in that. So when we get ready to sing here in just a moment, in order to live well, to live well, is to follow in his steps. So when you reflect on this past week, of what didn't go right, can you allow yourself to reflect of what Jesus would have done? I know the old adage, WWJD, right? Remember that when that came out, really popular. But this is truly a, one of those moments. What would Jesus do in your circle? And then how do you allow the Holy Spirit that dwells in the midst of every one of you that profess Jesus as your Savior and Lord? The same God that rose Jesus from the dead and the Holy Spirit rose Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that lives in every single one of you in here. How would you respond? What an encouragement. Wrestle through that. If you're wrestling through some unjust things that happen in your life, I ask that you surrender to the Lord. If you're struggling with things in your mind that you just don't know what's going on, surrender it. If you're dealing with illnesses or struggles of pain, lay it down. The master wants you to surrender.